I come to you the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This morning in our Gospel reading, we meet one of my favorite people in the entire Bible. The locust-eating, camel-hair-wearing son of a preacher named John the Baptist, who, like my Pentecostal forebears, knew how to preach an old-fashioned fire-and-brimstone sermon. In his one and only recorded homily, John says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of forgiveness, even now the axe is at the root of the trees. Therefore, any tree not bearing good fruit shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. With sermons like that, you kind of got to wonder if John the Baptist had a difficult time getting first-time visitors to come back to church. It seems like John the Baptist was obsessed with rooting out sin, with uncovering wickedness, exposing wickedness, and pointing his congregation toward the path of repentance. You see, John believed that at any moment the clouds would roll back, God would show up and right all of the world's wrongs. And in John's mind, God was not happy. According to John's theology, God was wielding a fiery axe of judgment, ready to cut down those trees bearing the fruits of wickedness, ready to separate the sinners from the saints, ready to harvest up the grain and burn up the chaff, ready to separate the good people from the bad people. John believed that at any moment God would show up and burn it all down. Now I realize that John's apocalyptic imagination might seem a bit strange to us good and upstanding Episcopalians, but what you got to remember is that John and his people John and his community had just went through some incredibly difficult years. The Roman Empire maintained law and order in John's neighborhood through violence and intimidation. King Herod, uh, down in Jerusalem, had turned the temple, the holiest of holy places, the place where heaven and earth were said to have met, Herod turned the church into a for-profit institution, into a tourist attraction, into a tool of wealth extraction that devoured widows' houses and filled the pockets of religious professionals. And Herod's son, we'll just call him Herod Jr., up in Galilee, well, he built political power at the expense of poor people. Poor people like Jesus' disciples, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. And if that wasn't bad enough, Roman world peace. Caesar's so-called Pax Romana took the form of a boot on the neck of John the Baptist and his people. So if you thought the years 2020 through 2023 were difficult, I would venture to say that the years 20 through 30 were just as taxing, if not even more so, for God's people, including John the Baptist, who were living in and around Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. You see, John believed John sincerely believed that the way the world is, is not the way that it should be. And at any moment, God would show up 
and right the world's wrongs via fire. That's what John believed. That's what John preached. And just so that we're all clear, when you are John the Baptist, when you have been burned by the way the world is, a little bit of fire from heaven, fiery judgment that rights the world's wrongs sounds like some pretty good news. It sounds like salvation, and maybe in some ways it is. John believed the way the world is is not the way that it should be, and he was waiting for God to show up and right the world's wrongs. And then one evening, on the River Jordan, right after one of John's fire and brimstone sermons, the Baptist gives an altar call. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, John invites anyone who is listening to come forward, to repent of their sins, to turn from their wicked ways, so that when God shows up with that fiery axe of justice, there will be a holy remnant. And as all of those sinners along the River Jordan are lining up, as the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are getting in line to take that plunge into the waters, to save themselves from the wrath to come, John sees Jesus. He's right there. He's right there in the crowd. He is getting in line right behind one of those good-for-nothing sinners. And this messes with John's mind. This challenges John's theology. This disrupts John's expectations. Somehow, some way, John recognized that Jesus was the anointed one of God. Jesus was the one who would come and right the world's wrongs, but this is not what John expected salvation to look like. You see, Jesus isn't carrying an axe. There's no fire shooting forth from his nostrils, and perhaps, worst of all, Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of sinners. Hanging out with a bunch of people who are publicly acknowledging their need for repentance. Publicly acknowledging their human brokenness. Publicly acknowledging their dependence upon God's love and upon God's forgiveness. Jesus is standing in line with all the wrong people. And when John sees this, he says to Jesus, he says, Lord, I don't want to be disrespectful or anything, but you're standing in the wrong place. I know you just had a long trip from Galilee, so maybe you're a bit confused, but you're not supposed to be in line. You're supposed to be at the head of the line, directing this line. You're not supposed to be hanging out with all these degenerates. You're supposed to be up front making judgments. Do you even know what type of people you are hanging out with, Jesus? Why don't you come on up front? Come on up front and be the Savior that I expect you to be. Come on front and do the things that I expect you to do. Come on up front and bring the type of salvation that I expect you to bring. But Jesus does not conform to John the Baptist's expectations. Instead, Jesus challenges John's theological presumptions, presumptions about sin, Repentance and salvation. Instead of wielding a fiery axe to cut down sinners, Jesus associates with all sorts and conditions of people. And by standing in line with, rather than calling fire down upon all of those sinners, all those wrong people, uh, Jesus fulfills all righteousness by standing in solidarity with us, particularly with those of us in need of a little bit more grace. Especially with those of us in need of a little bit more love, especially those in need of a little bit more healing. This is not what John had expected. 
He did not expect the Savior to bring salvation by standing in line for baptism with a whole bunch of sinners at the River Jordan, but that is how Jesus turns the world right. That's how Jesus rights all the wrongs of the world, by standing in line with sinners, by eating and drinking with tax collectors, by calling a bunch of nobodies to be his disciples, by associating with troublemakers and known criminals, by touching and healing folks who are contaminated and allegedly dirty, by inviting the children into the places that are holy and giving them a seat of honor at the Lord's table. John was expecting salvation by fire. But Jesus' salvation by solidarity is no less radical because it burns down those lines that we draw between sinners and saints, between good and bad people, and it proclaims the holiness of folks who have been told their whole entire lives that their lives do not matter. I would venture to say that we here, like John the Baptist, have had some pretty difficult years. COVID, the effects of climate change, an increasingly divided political reality, the list can go on and on and on and on. And although we may have different understandings about what salvation could or should look like, I'm guessing that we would all agree that the way the world is, is not the way that it should be. Some things, perhaps even a whole lot of things, are broken, and we are in need of some salvation. And if we're honest, some of us might admit to feeling a bit like John the Baptist, hoping that God would just show up and burn it all down and start over. Or at least burn up all those folks who we have conveniently labeled as sinners. We might all have different understandings of what salvation could or should look like. But based on what I read in the Gospels, I see that, that Jesus has a knack for disrupting our expectations. So if you're expecting salvation via, via fire and brimstone, Jesus just might surprise you with a dove descending from heaven. If you're expecting salvation through law and order, Jesus just might surprise you by turning over a few tables. If you are expecting salvation through walls that divide us from each other, Jesus just might surprise us by expanding our definition of neighbor. I don't claim to know exactly what salvation looks like or should look like for us in the Lehigh Valley, for us here at the Cathedral Church of the Nativity. But if the story is true, if the story of Jesus' baptism is true, if that old, old story is true, then I have got to believe that God's plan of salvation will likely disrupt our expectations, and it will probably look a little bit something like standing in line with sinners eating and drinking with tax collectors and allowing God to burn up those unholy divisions that we have drawn between sinners and saints, between so-called clean and dirty people. Amen.